Um, we'll just start from the beginning. Um, I guess I'll ask you why, when you guys like chose to found a fraternity, why did you choose Tau Kappa Epsilon? I was rushing in a Kappa Sig at the time, uh, back in 1948, and uh, uh, I would heard that the new group was being formed on campus at Aeneas Hall. Aeneas was a men's dormitory roughly south and behind uh, the student bookstore. <clears throat> and uh, they had about 20 guys and had been organized. They were looking to expand the group a little bit larger and had an informal contact with uh, Teak through one of his alumni, um, uh, Charles Anderson. And um, about six of us who were freshmen and sophomores at the time uh, thought this would be a good opportunity to help build a fraternity from the ground up at USC. And we particularly became even more excited once we learned a house was available. So there was a small pledge class in this group when the group was called the Scorpion Club, with a capital S-C-O-R-P-I-O-N. And uh, mostly World War II veterans, and uh, except for the ones who were in the pledge class, as I say again, which was a, a younger and more, but more diverse group. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I dropped my interest in Kaposig and decided to go with, um, uh, with the Scorpion Club. And of course, we were initiated in October uh, as, a, as a Beta Sig chapter that mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Now, how many, how many founding members were there? There was about, um, they were actually on the charter. And so I was hoping that we would take a look at the petition, uh, which lists them in their signatures. Uh, it was about 25, 26. But we also had some transfers that wouldn't be on the charter as beta six because, of course, they already had a school number before. We had a, three or four of those as well. Mm -hmm. So I say the initial group was around 30. Okay. And how was it um, getting a, a new fraternity um, in this system, which has a lot of tradition? Well, actually, I was pretty young to know at that point. You know, we're talk, talking about the beginnings here. Um, there had been some hang-ups on the row, as a matter of fact, because the, uh, the big houses versus the small house argument that had been going on. And we were going to probably break the chain in by coming on and becoming the odd man out, more or less. So they decided to bring another fraternity on with us at the same time to make it more palatable for the, uh, for the IFC to uh, vote us in. Um, I'm not too sure about the IFC politics at that time. I think we probably promised more than we can deliver, but to both sides, but uh, through some long swaggling, you know, we did get uh, recognized by the IFC. Huh, that's good. Uh, what, what do you remember most about living in the house? Well, of course, it was a brand new experience. Mm. And I only had a short experience living in the house. Uh, I lived at home mainly because my, uh, my home was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I think it was only a semester or a year at the most I lived in the house. Uh, but it was a camaraderie and fellowship and uh, uh, the oddball out things that we used to do uh, and have a good time. We were, we were pretty busy guys in the fraternity because we were new and we had that drive and energy of being the underdog more or less. So our, our, we were concerned with just things as size and activities. And uh, these are the things that were in the most. I think the things I remember the most was work on the floats. We did some elaborate floats uh, mm -hmm. uh, in our earlier times, and uh, it's a shame that these have been forgotten, but they were really, really, really a lot of work, you know, uh, to put them together and, and to accomplish that for homecoming. Um, the sense of working together, I think, was, uh, was something that we all learned from the fraternity and certainly something I prize the most. Hmm. Was, uh, did you guys also do something for Flapper Day? Did they have that? Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, did those things. I think I appeared as Oliver Hardy one time, didn't I? Uh -huh. <laughs> In the back of some car, I recall that. And uh, uh, 
Yeah, we did that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think our first, we also did house decorations uh, back in those days. And uh, I remember our first one, we had terrible knockdown, drag out fights over the theme. And it wasn't just left up to the committee to, to come up with a theme and do it, but, uh, um, but everybody voted on it, you know, and it was one of those type of hats. And uh, I remember our first one, and I haven't seen it, a picture of it since, or know very much about it, was with the Stanford homecoming game. And I think it was 48 or 49, but the theme was Tippecanoe and Stanford too, you know, with, because they were the Stanford Indians at that point. So we had this big canoe, you know, being tipped over by uh, a bunch of people uh, lashed to the front of the house here. It was the first home going decoration. <laughs> now, with all, um, what do you think happened to all that tradition, all the homecoming and flapper day tradition that we, we don't have anymore? I really don't know. I, uh, I'm starting to see it go. It sort of got phased out when University Avenue was closed mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, we had cars and traffic on it. Uh, back then, and you could parade around it. As a matter of fact, you had a, um, a good concourse there. Uh, perhaps it's because of that, perhaps because times have changed. Certainly, uh, the homecoming celebration at, at USC is, uh, is unique in its own way, uh, and it's, it's changed from the earlier days. Yeah. I wish I could give you a reason for it. I, I really have no idea. The leaders in the House, uh in 48, 49, 50, and all, throughout the 50s, were probably some of the best leaders that this house has seen um, in a while. Yes. Um, do you think some of that is attributed to having founded the fraternity and having that sense of... Well, I don't know whether it's attributed to founding the fraternity, but I know it's attributed to a very aggressive rush. Mm -hmm. We were always conscious of, uh, of getting leaders in the house. And as a matter of fact, we... Uh, throughout the 50s and early 60s. And we have much leadership uh, in the house to use and to utilize. Example, when we first came on campus, uh, Teak did not have a knight or a squire, which most every other house had two or three. And it was, they were carefully proportioned out among them. We were sort of uh, uh, 86, so to speak, uh, from, uh, from that action. So I went after the two independents they did, they did initiate an independent knight, an independent squire. And the independent knight was Jack Owen, and the squire was uh, Al Wiggins. And uh, they were both uh, sophomore at the time. And uh, uh, so we placed them. And that's how we got a foothold in the knights. Uh, Jack Owen later on became president of the knights on campus. And then we got a little greedy as we went through the the later 50s and 60s in which we would have 12, 13, 14, 15 members uh, involved in the Knights and Squires alone. Huh, that's, that's impressive actually. Um, were, were athletics a big deal for you guys, being a smaller house? No, not, not really to say so. It was more or less pickup and uh, it wasn't certainly organized to the extent that, uh, that it has become in recent years, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't recall much of the athletic scene except being used as a blocker. <laughs> My athletic skills were not that, uh, that great. Uh, we did participate, I'm sure, but uh, it was uh, really sort of come see, come side. It was not, not, uh, not really earnestly felt that this was a great thing mm -hmm. for us at the time. We, we were in very many activities now. We uh, were all over the place. Uh, with student body presidents and presidents of this. We had three presidents of Blue Key uh, in succession. Uh, we had a number of Skull and Dagger members. We had, uh, of course, our Knights and Squires. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, leadership throughout the house. It was very strong. Hmm. Um, can you tell me what effect uh, the wars had on the house, specifically? Uh, I, went, uh, I went directly out of the house I held four offices, Rest Chairman, Hegemon, Eastor, and F.I. Preetness. And I was F.I. Preetness in one under Dick Hall, who I want to mention here in a few minutes, who was Preetness at the time. And uh, this was a, a full call-up during the Korean War. So um, 
I was graduating. I had enough units to graduate. So I went to immediately from, uh, uh, from graduation right into the Air Force. And I didn't come out until uh, 57. But when I did come out in 57, uh, uh, the house had, had, had strengthened considerably. And, it was, and uh, during that period under the leadership of Connie Solon, who'd followed. And I think we had a, one of our first uh, 39 or 37 man pledge classes which is probably the largest we've had in the history of the chapter. And uh, uh, so we were uh, really very strong at the end of the war, at the Korean War. Now you've been involved um, with the House as a, as a national uh, person and or as a regional uh, officer. Yes. Um, what would you say happened to the House in the 70s, in your opinion? Well, it's going to be difficult to block out time. Um, I was serving in council in the 70s as, uh, as one of the um, eight trustees for the fraternity up to 1975. Um, I think we were on a growth pattern then, and I became addicted to the thought of expansion. That is, if TEAK is going to become significant, we're going to have to get up there with the big boys and have enough chapters to make our name. and. Uh, and uh, presence felt uh, on a number of campuses, which were opening to fraternities and sororities for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, there were arguments about this. There was generally two trains of thought. One, let's retrench, become small and elite, and the other one's let's grow and, and uh, try to do uh, a better job at uh, our national name. And I think I took the second path uh, and uh, started, to, started to interject my energies into the expansion process. I wrote the first expansion, not the first, but I wrote the first uh, composite expansion report for the National and, uh, and also helped pioneer in California such campuses as Loyola, Marymount, um, Long Beach State came in separately in 54. Uh, we also did uh, LA State uh, chapter. We did uh, Sacramento chapter, we did a Chico chapter, we did Humboldt, and this is an association with uh, Northern California Teaks. Hmm. Uh, but we began an expansion in California to uh, spread the word around and about the good deeds of Teak. Hmm. Um, do you see expansion as a, as a major must for the Yes. New? I'm glad you asked me that. Yeah, certainly if you see Russia as a major importance to keep the chapter going, then the national fraternity must see right, must see expansion as a major portion of its program mm -hmm. to keep the fraternity going. We're always going to have losses. Something, things sometimes get out of hand or develop, uh, no matter how many chapters you have. And I think the other nationals are finding that out more recently to their chagrin too. Uh, but if you if you keep a healthy growth of eight or ten new chapters a year, and you're only losing maybe five or six then I think you're, uh, you're really uh, on the right track. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, as for Beta Sig is concerned, do you think uh, expansion of numbers is needed or...? Um... Well, I'm most proud of Beta Sig recently mm -hmm. because uh, we were, of course, remember the days when we were down to one man I, in the mid-1980s. And fortunately, uh, uh, the Grand Council or some other People at headquarters didn't start ruling off the small chapters. Hmm. There's been um, there has been talk recently, for instance. Well, maybe we should cut back to 200 chapters from 300. But what do you cut? Why do you cut? And uh, sometimes you're going to make the wrong cuts. Mm -hmm. I think here it worked out uh, uh, that we imported some rushers uh, uh, during the summer. Uh, Rex Rolf, in particular, as I recall, and others, and uh, we did a magnificent job of of uh, raiding the dorms and, uh, and putting us back together. Slowly, true, but slowly, but very foul. Mm -hmm. Very foul. Uh, who was that one member, if you can recall, uh, in the 80s? That I really can't recall. Hmm. And that's, uh, I was sort of hung up at that point. Uh, family, family problem. My mother had Alzheimer's. So I, I had a sort of a, mm -hmm. a couple of years blank here. Mm -hmm. um, if you could describe in three words what what Beta Sigma was like when you were in the house. What what three words do you think you would use? 
a tremendous experience. Tremendous experience, very good. Um, is there any other, are there any other people that you'd like to, to recognize? Or? Yes, I think we should mention uh, uh, Beta Sigma's contribution to uh, uh, TK International. Uh, Dick Hall, as I mentioned, was pregnant when I got drafted, more or less, and uh, uh, he went on to become the uh, Grand Grand Mateus, elected from at a conclave, then retired and became the first appointed uh, CEO uh, Executive Director and moved the uh, office uh, of the fraternity from uh, Illinois to Kansas City. Um, Dick Hall, uh, his roommate here, was Jack Owen who I told you was uh, uh, president of the Knights. And Jack became a chapter management consultant, traveling fielder. Also, they, entered, they adopted the Apollo Creed at that point with the yellow scarf, which you'll see, and a yellow sash, I should say. And uh, that yellow sash, and they're knighted just like the Knights at USC. The ritual and everything was taken from the ritual of the Knights at USC in the maroon sweaters to the yellow sash ones for, for the take, uh, chapter management consultants and uh, exist until this day. Uh, Chuck Bishop was our chapter advisor. He was from Beta Chapter mm -hmm. and he lived in South Pasadena. And uh, he was elected Grand Chrysophilus also uh, after a period of time. Uh, I was elected uh, Grand Hegemon, Grand Hestor, and Grand Hypophetes, I believe it is. And uh, we also have from this chapter Bob McMurray, who was um, an honorary teak who uh, did his undergraduate work at Dartmouth. But uh, we initiated him here, and he is the uh, Chief Justice for the fraternity now and its legal affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all basic contributions uh, to the national, uh, uh, national leadership. It's huh. very impressive. Um, let me think of what else I have. You've answered quite a few. Um, the house, Beta Sigma now. Yes. Where do you see it going um, in the next 10 years? Oh, well, certainly I think we have to look toward building. Uh, we'd be silly not to, uh, to explore every possible avenue that we can. I don't think we have to be reckless, however. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use that term, uh, in uh, over, oversizing our needs. If we continue along the same path we're on now, and should we break 100 in membership, for instance, uh, then uh, I think it's time for us to, to look forward to uh, uh, new facilities of some kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not really prepared to specify what, because there's a number of different thoughts about that floating around. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we can, uh, uh, and there's also a question of ownership. Should we own our own property, or should we give the property to the school for a tax break? Uh, so there, there, are, there are some important considerations uh, to be considered. Hmm. Um, well, if there's anything else you'd like to add, let me... Well, historically, you had Reagan here in, the, in this chapter house. Okay. About where I'm sitting now, in front of the fireplace. Uh, he narrated the last uh, part of a film called Fraternity for Life, which was a 15-minute rush film mm -hmm. in color in 1965. And uh, we have some stills of him also. I think uh, Justin Wu has, uh, has most of those. I think that's uh, notable. Um, golly. Mm. So much has happened that, uh, uh, that you really wonder uh, how you can gloss over it, uh, because we were so involved in in student activity. We were very active in student activities at the mm -hmm. same time of being here. And uh, when Wiggins won student body president, uh, he defeated a string of independent presidents and was the first return to a row, a Greek, uh, uh, for instance, uh, which was, uh, the row was uh, just a mass of, uh, of cheering and jubilation at that point. <laughs> and I was proud to serve as his campaign manager and later as his parliamentarian. Huh. And uh, and also to see the, the guys in the chapter come and develop. We've, uh, 
I know you're interviewing some of them now. And uh, that to me is very heartwarming. Hmm. Um. Hmm. Um, what would you, what comments would you have about alumni involvement, specifically in, in Beta Sigma? Has it been strong? Would you like to see it uh, grow more? Over the years it's been on and off. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those who remained uh, sort of loyal and, and with it throughout the years. Uh, I'd say we're probably, uh, you could probably count them on two hands. Um, but other alums have dropped in and in and out and uh, have remained loyal over the years. I think there's more interest now, of course, since, uh, since we have a regular meeting place before the football games. And also, uh, just to see the house and its strength. And uh, I, again, uh, relive vicariously the, uh, <laughs> the, exact, the events that you guys are, are going through now. I'm very proud of the house, personally. And as I say, I was the first rest chair uh, for the chapter. Uh, not for the Scorpion Club per se, but uh, for basic chapter and uh, and the trials and tribulations we were going through it as brand new kids in the block. You, know? uh, you certainly have a much better background now for that than, than we did. Although I still see you're using three by five cars. <laughs> Do you think uh, things have changed much within fraternity life from when from when you were oh, certainly. active? Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, we were very prim, I guess is a, is a word I'm grasping for. Back in the 50s, women were not allowed, to, allowed upstairs. Uh, alcohol was not served in the house or any place around it except uh, oh, there were some sneaky parties, you know. But uh, um, yeah, I, I, there's, I, think, I think morals have changed quite a bit since then. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that had any effect on, on how Rush is conceived and how it's played no, out? No, not really, because Rush is an individual thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we were talking to or had selected, you know, we always had a select group of guys. At one point, the system that we used was, we took a closet door, when we used to have closets in the rooms, and we'd have a chart on the back of the door, inside of it, all the way down to the floor, with all the Rush East names on the left column, the dates that, the, uh, that we had planned for them, who the escort was, and uh, so forth and so on, so that uh, everybody had full information about everybody we were rushing. If it didn't pan out, we crossed them off the list or removed them. Hmm. Yeah, so systems... That's what we used to call our closet cases. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for university sports, um, did you guys get together for those like football games and whatnot? Like now we do the alumni tent, and we have a bunch of teaks, both active and alumni, go over there and yes, and we didn't have alumni, alumni of course, mm -hmm. and there were not great numbers. Mainly it was just the game thing. Everybody went and sat together at the games. It was uh, um, our house is the best house type of uh, action. You know, mm -hmm. houses were large then; they were not small. Uh, when we were when we were colonized. Uh, uh, Sig Ep ran and Pike A ran 120 men each, along with uh, uh, Sigma Chi being very large. Uh, Phi Sigma Kappa was very dominant. Kappa Alpha Order, where uh, uh, the Sig Ep house is now located, uh, was the jock house. It, uh, it had all sorts of uh, athletes and football players in it, and uh, most of the houses were 80 to 100 men, you know. So it wasn't unusual to see. Uh, Large turnouts at the at the game. Hmm. Um, I just had something I was going to ask, but I forgot it. Hmm. Well, let's take a break. Okay. And no, nope. oh, I have a couple more questions, but. Yeah. Go on with what you were talking about, it's fine. Yeah, I am. I, I, I certainly hope that a lot of our founding members uh, have a chance to, uh, to see this tape. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly uh, those who haven't been around the house for a while. I know Bill Moon, uh, number one on the scroll, is in Tucson, Arizona. I think he's, 
he was in real estate, he's now retired. Mm -hmm. I know that um, uh, uh, Lee Hirschberger, number 10, architect, is still working and living in South uh, Pasadena. We see him at the uh, football games frequently. Bob Meyer, mm -hmm. number six on our scroll, is uh, retired. Retired attorney and uh, uh, Major General or Brigadier General, Bob, I forget which, living down in La Jolla. He was our first house manager hmm. you know, thing, uh, at that time. And uh, certainly uh, some of these voices uh, I like to uh, have recorded at some period of time for history of Beta City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most likely they will. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, now the house has gone underwent uh, a lot of um, physical changes. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about some of those? Not really that much, except because I was seeing it from the, the viewpoint of either the board or as a chapter advisor or as a as a fraternity official, a district volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, the major changes were done by uh, Dave Oakley. The living room was paneled, as you see it now. From, uh, from what it was before. And of course the dining room was extended um, in the late 50s. And that was a different construction bit. Um, the whole house had to be, uh, had about $1,800 in uh, reconstruction on it before we could move in in 1948 because it was laced out as a V, uh, the Naval ROTC program, which was a SC and this was cut up into four apartments for married, uh, two upstairs and two downstairs. And uh, we had to remove all the, all the temporary walls and the plumbing, et cetera, and uh, also make a fire escape, mm -hmm. the wooden stairs that, uh, that come down from the bathroom upstairs. All this had to be a coffice before we could really move in in 1948. Hmm. Now, uh, the East House was... The East House was, uh, at that point, uh, owned by Sigma Nu. And as a matter of fact, we had a sort of a continuing battle with, with cherry bombs and, uh, and uh, shoe paint, or what do you call it? Uh, um, shoe polish. Yeah, uh, uh, through each other's windows and the whole bit. It was, it was an ongoing feud um, uh, to see who could, uh, who could uh, trick the other guy or whatever. Uh, the house then became available and was bought by A.E. Pye. Uh, fraternity, mm -hmm. and I was on the board of that at this time of the fraternity, and uh, with Conrad and uh, and several others, we had opposition to buy it, and it was cheap. Um, I think they offered it to us for fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand in a floating payment at the end, and uh, that's something I thought we could certainly afford at the point because this one was had been paid off, or was nearly paid off. So there was a lot of hassling going on. Some of the members of the board did fight us, but I'm glad we prevailed on that because naturally the, the two sides together now give us a 175 square foot uh, lot and uh, uh, which can influence our decisions of what to do when we build. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, uh, very happy that, that, that it worked out that way. Sigma Nu had obviously died in the room and in AEPI had bought the property. Mm. There's a there's a picture of the first pledge class in one of the scrapbooks. That's not the first pledge class. Oh, that's, it's not. That's, that's a little erroneous. It is a picture of the Scorpion Club, oh. uh, and it includes some members in there of the Scorpion Club who were not initiated into Teak. In other words, not all the members of the Scorpion Club actually put up the money and were initiated when the time came at that point. So uh, it's a little misleading in that direction, in that regard. So I was going to ask you about, are you in that picture? No, I'm not. You're not? No. No, nor are several other of the pledges. Huh. The, the, the pledges to the original club. Mm -hmm. Cal Campbell, myself, uh, I, I can't recall. There were about five or six of us. Hmm. Now, the, the first pledge class, you were the first rush chair, correct? Or? Right, that's correct, for, this, for the chapter. Uh, how big was that first rush class? If I remember correctly, and I probably am weak on this, but you'd have to check the scroll. I thought we did something like around 26 during the two semesters, the fall and the spring semester combined. Mm -hmm. um, we had a very good rush. 
when we used the UCLA house initially, because this house was, we were fixing up the construction work here, et cetera, and we didn't have it. We were, so we used the UCLA house with our uh, beer and fritters uh, uh, rush party. And, uh, but we did uh, use the principles of three by five cars, but we had so many people turn out that um, we used to, we had a deck of three by five cars, the multicolored ones, you know, the pink, the yellow, the blue, and the green thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put all our names on each, each, each three by five card, you know, with a pen because we were very sophisticated. And when we got really busy, if uh, they asked us who the, who the rushers were, well, they had a pink card, we tell them the guy in the green. If they had a blue card, I would tell them the guy in the ye yellow. So they were rushing for us, you know, while we uh, only had a small staff to serve the, the hot dogs and beverages. You know? huh. mm. were, they, were they really close pledge classes, those first few? Yes, very, very much so. Mm. Very much so. Unfortunately, it sort of broke down along the... Uh, the lines of the uh, uh, junior, senior versus freshman, sophomore. We weren't that sophisticated uh, in being able to uh, to do it too well. And also, we had there was a little bit of tension between the group that were veterans of World War II at that point and the kids who were just out of high school. Huh? Those who were just out of high school. Uh -huh. And I think that's. But looking at it afterwards, it's. It was to be expected as natural. You know, you were going through a transition, both in college education with the, uh, the GI Bill, many guys uh, going through and getting their education in SC uh, mm -hmm. that way, and, uh, and yet we still had uh, kids coming straight from high school. Huh. Uh, so one of the guys who probably remember, remember the most about that would be uh, Ned Serio. In fact, I recruited, he's also from my high school. We recruited about. Uh, Beta Sigma alumni who, uh, who uh, have been recognized as top teaks nationally mm. and are printed in the various books and manuals, etc. Mm. I can think of three offhand if there's probably more than that. Um, now I can think of four. And these are really significant names. Mm. Mm -hmm. Are we running? Yeah, oh yeah, we're running. Go ahead. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, caught me. Uh, we've had at least four, maybe five, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to recapture their names, uh, of uh, Beta Sigma alumni who um, have been voted and selected and awarded a medal as being the top teak of the fraternity at various different years and times. Uh, one of them is Patrick Rowland in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. former Preetness here. Um, one of them is uh, uh, Ned Serio, uh, who I mentioned uh, was active here. Uh, one of them is Tom Forkelson, who, I, I met, who lives in Newport uh, uh, Beach area and has been uh, active uh, in the chapter in the 50s. And uh, myself, of course. And uh, I think I may have uh, left someone out. I don't want to do that because... Uh, they certainly deserve the recognition and, and honors uh, uh, thereby. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, handsome little medal. Mm. Huh. Okay, one last question. Um, if there's one thing that you got out of, out of being a teak that you cherish the most, what would that be? Golly. Patience. That sounds funny, doesn't it? You know, I used to be a very raw, jump up and down, let's get things done guy. And I think compromise has now been uh, is taught as, as a viable word for, uh, for our learning and leadership of activities. And to do that, you have to have patience. Mm. Patience when things go bad, patience when things go good, patience when things don't look too great, and, uh, and a, whole, uh, uh, a whole raft of, uh, of reasons why. But, uh, yeah, I think patience. Hmm. Or compromise. You can pick either one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, if there's any one more thing you'd like to say, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm done with questions. No more questions, huh? Uh, I can't think of any. I just, uh, my, West, my best to the uh, chapter, when it's the anniversary, I'm, I'm very proud of you. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of our alumni. And... Uh, 
I wish us many, many more years here at uh, USA. Mm. Oh, it's a great way to end it. I'm going to have to end it there. <laughs>